Good evening, or can I give everyone a few minutes to log in? Um, as you join us, if you would like to share where you're joining us from, um, I'm joining from Chicago, Illinois. Ooh, San Diego. I want to be on a beach. <laughs> South Carolina, Long Island. All right, so we got coast to coast so far. Okay, one more minute and then we'll get started here. All right. Uh, welcome to Backbone Women and SPI Health Talks. This program is funded by the Christopher and Dana Reeves Foundation. My name is Emily Lacey, and I am the program coordinator. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be sent to everyone who registered via email and uploaded to our YouTube channel, where you can also find past recordings. The link will be dropped in the chat shortly. Um, if you are new to Backbones, our organization is committed to helping people with spinal cord injuries and similar disabilities find connection and community. We do this by hosting events both in person and virtually, facilitating one-on-one -on -one peer support, and providing resources to individuals with spinal cord injuries and their families when they're trying to navigate life post-injury. We encourage you to check out our website at www.backbonesonline.com to find out more information about our program. We are a community-led program that seeks to bring awareness and education about women's health in the context of SBI. Our topics and format were the results of two community listing sessions where women from SCI from across the country provided insight. To continue to be community-led and directed, we will send an email tomorrow with a short survey, as well as a copy of this webinar, which you are welcome to, free, to share freely. Um, the link to the survey will also be dropped in the chat. The survey is five questions, and it should only take you a few minutes to complete. We thank you in advance for filling it out. In addition to this recorded webinar, we also have a private only for women with SCI small discussion group to unpack the conversation from tonight, share personal experiences and support. If you're interested in the small group, please go to our website at backbonesonline.com and click the program tab. The link will also be dropped in the chat. Lots of links. <laughs> uh, I will introduce our amazing guest speakers here shortly. We will have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end of the webinar. You are welcome to submit questions for our speakers through the Q&A option on Zoom or send them directly to me in chat. I will read questions that are submitted. Uh, if at any point you would like Jen or Rachel to clarify something, please use the raise your hand option and type your clarifying question in chat. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Jen Goodwin and Rachel Chapman. Jen Goodwin is a mom of two active boys, a disability rights attorney, and a person with a C5-6 spinal cord injury. She pursued her law degree post-injury when she decided to change her career path. She decided she wanted to be a mom, even as a single quadriplegic in law school and took an alternative path to make it a reality. She always wanted her son to have a sibling. So she adopted a baby boy last year. Uh, now she loves advocating to help others get back to their lives and spending as much time with her boys as possible. They also love to travel and explore outside. Rachel Chapman became paralyzed after a 2010 accident where her best friend playfully pushed her into a pool during her bachelorette party. She is now a blogger and social media influencer on a mission to break stereotypes and educate others about spinal cord injuries. She loves playing wheelchair rugby and spending time with her husband and seven-year-old daughter. Rebecca Torres is our moderator for tonight's webinar. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Jen and Rachel. I will now hand the webinar over to Rebecca. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Emily. Thanks. I'm gonna make sure that everyone is spotlit just so that uh, it's I and myself. There we go. 
Welcome, Rachel and Jen. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and being willing to share your story. Like Emily said, we are um, doing a series of these um, webinars, and when we started, I, I when we started this series, I actually thought of both of you um, right away, and I wanted to have both of you be part of this at some point, and I'm glad I was able to get you together because yeah. this is a really great topic, and you both have really unique stories, um, and um, it's important to talk about this, right? We, we often talk about um, women with disabilities and specifically women with SCI being able to um, become mothers and usually those topics are around pregnancy and ab around you know more of the the traditional I guess ways of, of someone becoming a mother and so um, you two like I said you two have a unique story and I want people to, to know about it um, but I guess first if we can start off um, if you can both share a little bit about yourself, maybe how you were injured or your injury level or any other, you know, any other things you want to share around surrounding your, your injury story. Um, yeah, um, I'll go first, I guess. Um, so um, like, like you guys said, I was hurt at my bachelorette party. Um, I was supposed to be getting married like four to five weeks after that party. Uh, I was pushed into the pool mm -hmm. and had a C5, C6 injury. And I knew instantly I was paralyzed um, and I turned out to be a complete injury. And so I have no triceps. I have no, well, I have a little bit of triceps, um, but I have zero finger function. Um, so I'm pretty decent wrist, but obviously nothing from the chest down. So that's the function that I'm kind of working with. And yeah, I haven't really regained much since that accident, but I have gotten stronger just because I'm doing a lot more. So yeah. All right, and my story um, is kind of ugly, but um, a little unusual as well. So I was on a boat with a neighbor sitting in the passenger seat of a bass boat and he was standing on the back platform of his boat facing backwards and he fell and just sat on my head. So 250 pounds on my spine, just straight down and um, like Rachel said, I knew immediately that I couldn't feel my legs. I knew that I was paralyzed. Um, with mine, I begged him for help and he didn't believe me. So it made for a really long night. I'll spare you guys some of the details, but essentially he drove me across the water with my body just flopping and me begging him to get me help and um, pulled me on the boat, dropped me on the concrete a couple times and ultimately put me in the floorboard of his truck and told me he was taking me home to put me in bed. So um, luckily I begged long enough and he did take me to the hospital um, after a 45 minute drive in the floorboard of his truck. And then um, the paramedics came out and they knew immediately that, uh, first of all, he told them I was faking it. and. <laughs> But they could tell immediately that um, she could feel the bones broken in my spine with her hand whenever she was, you know, trying to put a neck brace on me and pull me out of the truck. So I have a C5 and 6 spinal cord injury, um, but it is incomplete. So I did regain a ton. I couldn't do anything in the beginning. My initial goal was to get my hand high enough to scratch my nose while I was in rehab. And since then, I have regained um, decent tricep control. Um, a little bit of finger function, a little bit of ab control. So I've got some decent trunk, trunk support. And um, ironically, after my pregnancy, a little bit of leg movement. So um, that was a little surprise that we can discuss later. But um, so anyway, I've definitely gotten a lot stronger, mainly from hauling babies around, it seems, and just being really active at this point. So yeah, and you're both, thank you for sharing both your stories. You know, sometimes it's it's hard to share their stories, but also like we, we I feel like all three of us have probably shared our stories over and over yeah. so many times. Um, right. So thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, so let's get into it. Um, like I said earlier, this webinar is about different ways that someone can become a mother and, um, you know, other, 
other than the traditional paths. Um, uh, usually, these, sometimes these are not the paths for us women with disabilities. So I want to talk to, I want to talk about these journeys for you, um, and what it was for you to become a mother, maybe, you know, how you came to um, realize, you know, the, that you wanted this and, and um, what led you to each of your journeys and how did you prepare for that once you, you were like, this is what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it and how did you prepare for that? You can go first. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, so I decided about five years post-injury, I gave everything I had to rehab. And then I, as I say, I got bored being at home. And so I was ready for something different. So I decided to try law school. Um, I wanted to figure out if I could do school before I tried to do work. And then my second year of school, I decided that I also wanted to try motherhood. <laughs> And so um, why not throw that in the middle of law school? It just made sense in my world. Um, and so I decided to go that route. But for me, my mom is an OB nurse. And so she would come home and I would hear stories every single day of just sad situations that these children were going home in. And so many people that were having children that they, you know, would be considered an accident or they really weren't prepared for and they weren't even interested in, but they were taking home these babies. And for me, every single day I yearned to be a mom. And that was just something that had always been a desire of mine. I've always planned to have a whole house full of children. And then all of a sudden it doesn't feel like reality at all. And so I was looking around and at that point I only knew two women in Arkansas that had ever had children as quads and both of them had some complications that were pretty scary and um, had some lifelong consequences with that too. And, you know, could have, but um, it was something that I didn't think was really possible. And so I started doing some research and looking into it. I was looking into surrogacy. I was looking into adoption and I kept thinking, well, who's going to pick me as a single quad mom to adopt their baby? You know, like, how's that going to work? And so that's probably not going to be reality for me. And, um, you know, just trying to figure out what the steps were going to be. My doctor knows me well. Um, we are friends as well, my ob -GYN. And so mom mentioned one day about me wanting to have a baby. And she said, Jen can carry a baby. She can do this. And that was all it took for me. That was my yes. Mm -hmm. And so I took it and ran with it and then really had to figure out, okay, well, probably need a partner of some sort for that to happen because I can do a lot of things but not that so anyway I had to figure out you know okay well I'm single and what am I going to do and so I went on the strangest shopping trip of my life um with going to a cryobank and just looking around and online shopping when you're looking for as I like to call them daddy bits is kind of strange <laughs> <laughs> but it's great you know it was really cool of something just to enlighten you a little bit but um you get to go in and it's really like a search I mean you can pick height and weight and nationality and education and all kinds of different functions of what you're searching for and um so I searched through a whole list of different options and paid a little extra to get the pictures too because why not? You're making big decisions here on who the father of your children are going to be. And so um, I finally narrowed it down and I was told that it would take typically five tries. So I just decided to buy three. And I was like, you know, if this is supposed to happen, then it's going to happen in this amount of time. And if it doesn't, then I'll try again or I'll rethink my plan and figure out the next path in my life. And so um, for me, I needed to meet with all of my doctors. I met with a maternal fetal medicine doctor before my um, fertility doctor would work with me. He was like, you know, I want you to understand all of the risk. And so I went and met with him and he gave me the rundown of kind of all of the things that 
could go wrong that were true possibilities. And again, I wanted a baby more than I wanted to breathe at that point. And every risk was worth it to me. So I picked my donor and went in and tried it the first time and it didn't work. And then the second time I took that test and got that extra line and found out I was pregnant. And so um, I see there's a question about how old I was at this point. So I was 31 at that point. And so um, I decided it was time to get it done if I was going to do it, basically. And so um, when I was 30, I got out of a relationship that I needed to be out of. And that was also when I went back to law school. And I say that's when I took back my life as well and just decided that um, you have to make things happen on your own. And so that's what I decided to do. And so anyway, I actually had a fantastic pregnancy. It was not as complicated as I thought that it would be. I did a lot of meeting with my doctors during my pregnancy. So I met with the entire anesthesia team um, way early because that is the big part of being a quad and having a baby is just autonomic dysreflexia would be a big concern. And so we met to discuss how we would handle that. And even though I don't have a ton of feeling um, below my level of injury, I do have some, but we wanted to make sure that I had an epidural early. So it wasn't gonna trigger autonomic dysreflexia and severe blood pressure issues going into it. So we did that. I did lots and lots of ultrasounds um, with maternal fetal medicine, but I ultimately decided to deliver at my small town hospital with my doctor because it felt like home to me. And those were the doctors that were doing the research and no one else had any experience delivering quads either. So um, I needed to be with people who genuinely cared about me and were willing to go in the battle with me and just, you know, make it happen. So we had a lot of unknowns. We had no idea if I would be able to feel contractions, if I would be able to push, if I would need a C-section what I would need, any of those things. And so ultimately I went into labor at 34 weeks and four days, ironically on Father's Day, which just makes me laugh given my situation, but um, somebody got a Father's Day baby. So we, um, I told my mom, who's my OB nurse mom, and she's also um, my main caregiver. She's the one who's here with me all the time. They live next door. So I built a house next door to them after my injury. And I said, mom, I think I'm having contractions. And I would be like, oh, there's one. There's one. And yeah, I realized it was about five minutes apart. And she didn't really believe me at this point. She's like, go to bed, lay on your left side, drink some water, you're fine. Because what you typically see for people that are truly in labor is that they can't speak between their contractions. But for me, it was, oh, there's one. And so I finally convinced her. I was like, no, something is different here. This is not Braxton Hicks. This is nothing like that. There's something going on. And so we went into the hospital and found out that I was dilated to four at that point and was hundred percent effaced. And so my doctor and my anesthesiologist came in and they did an epidural. It worked perfectly. We decided we were having a baby. It was a little scary because he was early, but I knew that he wasn't too early. I knew he would be okay. Plus, I just believed 100% that he was going to be okay. And I believed 100% that I was going to be okay. That was just my attitude throughout the entire thing. I told everyone, it's okay. I've, you know, I'm good. I'm going to be okay. And I believe positivity really helps with that. I think my faith helped with that as well. But, um, Again, we had no idea if I'd be able to push, if I'd be able to have this baby. They had um, vacuums and suction, all that sort of stuff ready. And the beautiful part of it was I pushed four times and we had a baby. So he was, he came out screaming and red and perfect. Um, the part I thought was really funny was they handed me the scissors to cut the umbilical cord. <laughs> I was like, well, I can't really cut paper. So um, I'm going to pass these scissors on to somebody else to cut. But um, they handed me a screaming baby boy and he was perfect. And he did have to go to the NICU for about a week, uh, maybe mainly on the grower feeder floor just to get a little bigger. And so they can monitor him. He was jaundiced for a few days, which is pretty common for premature babies. And 
so we did that and I came home with a five pound baby boy to start this journey with. So that's amazing. That's great. Um, and I'm, I'm going to jump over to Rachel and then I'd love to come back to baby number two, Jen. <laughs> okay. I, I just saw a question in the chat too. Do you mean to go ahead and take that? Sure, as well? go ahead. So um, with pain and spasms, I did have a few more spasms. I really didn't have a lot of pain. I do have sensation, um, but it really, it wasn't bad. I mean, I hear women, able-bodied women talk about how uncomfortable pregnancy is and all of that. And I don't know if it was just, I was just so dang excited to be pregnant or what, but it, it wasn't bad for me. Labor was not bad at all. Of course, I had an epidural early and I do recommend that if you're a quad. Um, but I, I got a pregnancy pillow from my masseuse. <laughs> so I was actually able to lay on my stomach once I got bigger because that's how I normally sleep. Um, because positioning is always hard for sleeping. Um, so I was able to do that, but yeah, it was, it was great. I love pregnancy. And, and for those with more questions on pregnancy, we are going to have our next month webinar will be really, uh, we'll be diving into like the whole pregnancy process and have other guests too. So, um, well, thanks for sharing that. Um, Rachel, do you want to share how? Yeah, I was like, in <laughs> I'm sorry, I was looking down so much. So I, I think my husband put the dog in the bedroom so that he could vacuum downstairs. And then the dog is clawing at the door over here. So that's why I was like, come get this dog. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so my path was definitely different. Um, so when I got hurt that night, like on the side of the pool after I was paralyzed, I remember asking the ENTs, like, can I still have kids? And I don't even know why that was like number one answer. Like, that's like the first question that I asked. And I knew I wanted kids, but it wasn't like something I thought about. Like all the time I was 24 years old, um, but it was definitely my first question um, when they arrived and they said, yes. And that was like this little moment of hope. Um, and I was like, okay. And I don't remember much after that, but I do remember them saying yes. And, um, and so, you know, a couple of years go by and we decide that we'd like to, you know, go for it. And at first we were thinking I would do, we would just do it naturally. Um, but I, I am on like a lot of medicine because of low blood pressure and because of nerve pain. And all, I mean, I was on, I was on more at that point than I am now. And so that was definitely something that I was worried about. So I'm like, I'm on baclofen, gabapentin, and midodrin. And I remember us having a meeting with the lady, the OBGYN, and she said that, you know, you could like lower your baclofen and lower your gabapentin, but it's an absolute heck no to midodrin. You can't be on midodrin and be pregnant at the same time. I'm pretty sure that's true. But anyway, that's what she said. Um, and the reason is because, you know, I'm, I obviously have very, very low blood pressure and that's what the midodrin is for. And so the midodrin increases your blood pressure. Well, the problem is that a baby, there's nothing wrong with the baby's blood pressure. So it's, it's not good for the baby. Um, and so at that point I was, I really needed that medication. I'm off it now. I'm doing a lot better than I was then. Um, but at that time it was like, well, if I'm not on it, I'm going to be like passing out because I'm so dizzy. And if I am on it, then it's not safe for the baby. So um, I was kind of at a crossroads there. And so we decided to um, look into surrogacy. And obviously the first thing you see when you look up surrogacy is how expensive it is. I mean, it's incredibly expensive. Like if you were to just go through a surrogacy agency and, you know, have them find your surrogate and do all of the requirements that the agency requires of you, it could be, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. And so it definitely makes you feel like it may not be possible. Um, for us, so I decided to do a little more research. I found a nonprofit and they would be actually willing to donate a decent amount so, you know, through, through their nonprofit. The only issue is I needed a surrogate. So I remember writing a blog, it wasn't necessarily like asking anyone in particular, but I just put a blog out there that I was interested in surrogacy, why I wanted to be a mom and things like that. And then this friend that I knew from college who I literally only knew for like a month um, she was a friend through Chris. She was older. She graduated 
hadn't talked to her in a decade and she messaged me and said that she would love to be my surrogate and at no cost. Um, you know, had she not done that, then this path may not have happened for me. Um, because again, like a surrogate alone can cost $30,000. And so once she was in and then we were all in, like, we're going to make it happen financially, however we could. Um, and so the nonprofit was actually in California. So it was actually more cost effective for me to fly to California, do all of my, um, the egg retrieval and the blood work and all of that in California. Um, and then come back and then go back with my surrogate <laughs> so that they could, you know, make her pregnant. And so that's basically what we did. And um, it's definitely a process. The egg retrieval was fine and everything worked out really well. And so at the end of the day, we had four embryos that were super healthy. We did genetic testing to make sure they were healthy. They turned out to all be girls. So we didn't have to decide whether we wanted a girl or a boy. <laughs> Um, and so that's the route that we went and we were very, very fortunate that we had a lot of support because unfortunately surrogacy is, it's ridiculous how expensive it is. And it's horrible that it's not covered by insurance. Um, that is like something that makes me super angry. And I've never been one to not say that I know that I'm lucky because I have people who support me and because I have my Facebook page, but Without that support, I don't know exactly what we would have done. Um, and yeah, but that was our route. And so my surrogate lives like four hours away from me. And so we went there to Asheville when it was about time, you know, when she was like around the due date. And we, Kaylee ended up being really, really late. So like eight days late. So we were just sitting there at Laurel's house for eight days, staring at each other like, but Come on, Kaylee. Um, we were trying everything, the pineapple, the spicy food, jumping on the trampoline. Like my mom was giving her foot massages, like trying everything. But um, anyway, so she had Kaylee in 2015 and she just turned seven. And so that's how I was able to become a mom. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> and, Thank you. And, and Jen, if you wanted to talk a little bit, I know it's set, uh, your second uh, boy, um, was through adoption, correct? Yes. Can I talk sure a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I knew after I had Becca and after, sorry, you guys are hearing the birds in my background. Mm -hmm. um, but so I knew after I had Becca um, that I really wanted him to have a sibling, especially with me being a single mom. I wanted him to have some people here on this earth um, for him. And so I know I won't live forever and I wanted him to have somebody um, that would be here with him. So I knew that I wanted a sibling for him and I started thinking about, okay, well, am I going to do this again? But I also knew the risk that were associated with that somewhere. I thought I might meet Mr. Wonderful and have a baby with him, but apparently he's hiding. So that might happen someday. Um, but um I started looking into the process of doing it again, um, same way doing artificial insemination, but it was during COVID. So there were also extra concerns for my health if I was going to do that again. And I had to really consider, okay, last time I was willing at all costs to do anything it took. This time I am a mom to Beckham and he needs me to stay his mom. He needs me to be here for him. And so it wasn't worth the risk to me at that point because I have him. And so um, I kind of just closed the door on all of it. I was like, okay. And I just decided I was going to completely pour into him and um, which I was doing anyway, because he's one of the loves of my life for sure. But um, anyway, I just decided that Well, my mom being an OB nurse, sometimes strange things happen. And she called me um, in March about a baby. And she said, Jen, baby for adoption. What do you think? And I was like, uh, uh, I don't know. Cause this never happens. And it took me a minute to think it through. And I eventually said, yes, but it took me a minute. And long story short on that, that wasn't my baby. So three days later, we thought that he was going to be ours and he wasn't he got transferred to another hospital and some other people got involved after mom and said yeah you know I picked 
this family, whatever. Um, but then once he got transferred, something else happened and he went to another family. But what that did for me was it reopened all of those feelings of how much I did want another child and how much I wanted that for Beckham as well. And so I couldn't believe it. But six weeks later, she called me again and said, baby for adoption, what do you think? And that time I was able to emphatically immediately say yes. And so I called an attorney friend of mine who um, I went to law school with and I said, help, what do I do? He does adoption law. And so um, he gave me the number to give to the birth mom. She had come in, she just didn't have a plan. So she was 10 days from delivery at that point. And she didn't have a plan. Her plan was just to take the baby to a fire station and leave him there after delivery. And so her doctor said, I can do something better than that. I've got a family right now. And of course, they all knew that I was interested at that point. And so they called my mom. Mom called me. This is not the traditional pathway, by the way, but it is my pathway to adoption. Um, and so I called um, the attorney. The attorney gave her his number or the doctor gave her his number and she didn't call. So for a whole week, and I just had to keep it at arm's length because I'd gotten my heart wrapped around the baby before that. And I knew that I couldn't feel those feelings again yet. So the next Tuesday, they called and wanted that number again because she was in for another appointment. And so we gave the number to him again. I just went to a baseball game that night like my life was normal. And I got a call from my attorney that said, hey, Jen, I just had a lovely conversation with the birth mom. So did you get that home study done yet? And I was like, nope. Sure didn't. And by the way, she's being induced on Friday. It was Tuesday. So I kicked it into high gear. Um, the next day I filled out, I think about 15,000 pieces of paper. So I needed three letters of recommendation. I needed a letter from my doctor. I needed a letter from Beckham's doctor. I needed a letter from my employer. That was a fun call. Hey, by the way, I'm gonna be off for a little while, <laughs> starting in three days, actually starting today because I gotta do a home study. Um, I filled out, like I said, just a million pieces of paper that day they came and, um, checked out my home the next day. I told Beckham the day before they were coming for the home study, Hey, some people are coming and to try to get us a baby so you can have a brother or sister. What do you think? And he was over the moon excited. He'd been asking me for a sibling for years at this point. And so they came in, I was concerned that they might have questions about my ability to parent as a single quad mom and they didn't at all I mean they asked me how I do some things and they looked around and they saw that my home was full of love they could see how Beckham and I interacted they could see the love that I had for him and they could see that I had family support because my mom was there to be willing to help me with anything else that I needed and um, she told me it was actually the most glowing home study that she'd ever done so it made me feel really good that there was no, um, no issues with me um, and my disability to be able to care for him. And so the next day, um, well, while I was doing the home study, she was signing away her rights at my attorney's office. The next day I had to go for one more meeting with them while she was going in to be induced. Um, my mom was at my house digging through all the stuff I had left from Beckham to see what we might have because I had a baby in three days and so um I was at the hospital when he was born it was a closed adoption so she actually never knew anything about me she still doesn't know anything about me she doesn't know my story because she didn't want to know and so and I conversely I don't get to know her story either I just know a few things about her but I know that she gave my son life and she gave me the biggest gift that she could have ever given and so I'm eternally grateful to her for sure. And um, he was born. They brought him straight over to my room. I roomed in with him at the hospital. Sorry, I'm about to have a spasm jump everywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, he was there and was mine from day one. And um, at the end of the month, we went to court and got it all finalized. And he's a one-year-old now learning to walk. So life is fun. And Beckham is the best big brother ever. He adores baby Roman. So 
it's pretty awesome. It sounds like both your stories, you know, just like <laughs> things, things just happened at the right time and in, in a way that, you know, made this possible for you both. It's pretty, it's pretty great. It made it feel right. Yeah. Well, talking about everything aligning and being well, I'm sure you've gone through a lot of barriers um, on your journey as well, whether it be attitudinal barriers from um, just people and um, maybe healthcare professionals, maybe physical barriers. You already talked a little bit about, you know, some financial stuff with fees and, you know, and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, are there other things that, that you recall or even today that you still sort of face in terms of like barriers as as mothers i mean there's definitely um i've gotten a lot of comments that it was selfish for me to you know bring a baby into this world as a as a per you, you, not even just a quad but just when people see the wheelchair they automatically think that it's selfish if that person has a baby and then i'm always like well what if somebody already had a child and then they got hurt like does that mean they're not a good mom like um, it's kind of ridiculous. It's nothing I ever get, never let get in the way of how I felt and my confidence of being a mom, but it's just sad. I mean, in general, that that's like the, you know, a very, you know, that's, I don't, I don't know if the word is common, but I mean, I've heard it a lot. Um, and obviously like physical barriers. So for me, I don't have, you know, I'm a legit C5, C6 complete. So, um, you know, for, I'm just starting to drive now, but there's little things like driving like um in car seats and strollers like there's no stroller that is really made for a wheelchair especially as a quad in my situation so there's just not a lot of equipment out there you kind of have to I know we're going to get like onto like things that we have used um equipment wise but the world really isn't made for being in a wheelchair and being a mom there's not a lot out there for it so that was my main barrier and I would agree with that as well. And um, my story kind of got out there pretty quickly as well with new stories and stuff that hit, um, especially whenever I decided to um, take on pregnancy as a single quad. And so um, when it's in the national circuit. <laughs> as we're talking about this, I love it. Sorry, go ahead. So, you know, when it hits the national circuit and you're hearing comments from people all over the nation um, about your choice to become a parent. It's kind of um, interesting and they warned me, just don't read the comments, but that's not me and I read them. And what I found was that most people were actually really encouraging. And um, one of my favorite quotes that I said in one of those interviews was, if you think you can live your life better than me, then I'd like to see you try. Because people have no idea what their hopes and dreams and desires are gonna be um, until they're in the situation. And um, what I found is that mine didn't change. I still wanted to be a mom and I still was going to figure out how to make that happen. Um, I got a lot of comments about him not having a dad. And again, maybe someday, hopefully they will. And, but it's going to take somebody really special that's going to be um, incredible for the three of us. So, and until we have that, we're going to wait. <laughs> But um, I had a Honda Element at the time. And so I was able to, I'd practice with a baby doll. So I got a weighted baby doll right after I found out I was pregnant um, to practice with. I carried around a car seat with me pretty much everywhere that I went. So I had a car seat in my lap. Um, I learned how to push that evil red button on the car seat with a buckle bopper. So um, if anyone is in need of that, those things are fantastic because they allow you to use your whole hand instead of just thumb function to um, push the button to get your baby out and until Beckham was about six months old I was able to lift it in and out of the car seat but after that um, I got a kidney infection and got really weak at the same time that he had a growth spurt at about six months and so at that point it got to where he was too heavy for me and so then we had to start going with other people I couldn't go out on my own at that point until he got to where he was big enough that he could crawl in and out of the car seat. So probably at about two or so. And things are definitely different with Roman um, in that now I drive a Tahoe and I can't get him in and out of that car at all on my own. But 
I am working from home now. And with COVID and everything that's been going on, I always have people around me. I have a support system um, that anytime I need to go somewhere, there's somebody there that's going to help me and get him in and out of the car seat. And we just go and do our things. So again, my parents live next door. So that helps tremendously. Yeah, and you bring up a good point about having people around you. And one of you mentioned earlier about it taking a village. Yeah, she um, did. How, how have you made your village or created your village? It's It's been incredible in my world, just the people that have stepped up. So um, when I had Becca, I had one aunt that had just retired. And um, she stepped in she was Susie to Beckham and they just formed a fantastic bond um when my mom's not or when my mom is working as a nurse then she was here um was fantastic with him and has been you know great for our family is still here for sure helping us all the way and then when I had Roman I had another aunt that was able to say hey I want to help out and so again when my mom's working then she's here with us during the day and my dad's actually inside with the boys right now um, taking care of them. And so I've had, you know, just family members and friends. We've got some people from church who stepped up kind of as second grandparents to help out and they take him for a day. And so it's just been everybody piecing it together. And it's, it's not what you would consider normal, I don't think. But then I talk to other people that are like, takes my village to get it done too. So whether they have a disability or not. Oh, so for me, it's been definitely mostly my mom. So as soon as I was hurt, she was already kind of basically living with us. Um, so that was before, you know, Kaylee, but we all were like, she wanted to be a grandma. We wanted to be parents. We knew that we were just going to all do this together. Um, so she was a big part of our journey still is. So she still stays with us. I will say this though, that if anyone out there is like, you know, wanting to be a parent, that it's those first like couple of years that are the hardest because as they get older, even at like one and a half, she like was learning to climb onto my lap. And then at two, you can hold the shirt up while they put their arms in, you know, little things that are, you know, make you be much more independent with them. You know, the fact that she can get in and out of her car seat now, now she's at the age where we can actually go somewhere together, which I wasn't able to do that before. Um, Cause I mean, like I said, I don't have any finger function. I just couldn't get that stupid red button. Keep that thing. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so now that she's, seven or just turned seven um like a couple weeks ago so um the, every year it's like if she as she's learning more adapting more she's making it easier for us to be like independent together so. and you both mentioned too like just finding solutions you, you just talked about this big red button and you were talking about cribs like how and there isn't a lot of information out there for mothers with disabilities how did you um, you know, either find your own solutions or reach out to others. I've had a really good group on Facebook um, that is full of other moms with spinal cord injuries. And to me, that helped tremendously, just knowing that there were so many of us out there and we weren't isolated. And so we had, you know, if we have questions, that's kind of the first place that I go to about anything. I think it's really important to have that community of like-minded people who understand what you're going through. So, I have to put out there too, that when I had Buckham, I said, I don't need another baby. I just need a six-year-old. So mm -hmm. when I had Roman, I am amazed at how helpful Beckham is with him. So even now, and for several months now, um, when Rome's crawling around in the floor and I need him in my lap, I can't get him in my lap, but Beckham can pick him up and put him in my lap for me. So even at six years old, he is incredibly helpful um, with baby. So who knew? I love it. And then I've it. seen Rachel, Rachel, I know I remember one scene, a photo of, of Kaylee helping, helping you do like laundry or something. Oh yeah, she was, was barely so walking. <laughs> yeah. Like obviously, I, I mean, I, I could do it, but she thought it was like a game and she just like, I was like, go put it in there. And she was just going back and forth, like one or two things at a time. She is literally just learned to walk and was doing that. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's those like really joyful moments. Are there other, you know, pleasant surprises that you all might want to share of like that you didn't expect um, about 
your journey becoming a mother? I'm sure there's a lot, but. I mean, for sure how adaptable kids are. I mean, how, I mean, like, and there's nobody that hands things to me better than Kaylee does, like, because of my finger function, like, she holds it a little second longer or, like, does it at a certain angle, like, nobody, like, can hand me things like she does. Um, she's just adapted from a very young age. It's all she's ever known, obviously, so. Like I said, like every year, like as those years go, you guys get to know each other more and more and more and she understands more and more and more. And so it was a bit easier than I thought it would be because she was so adaptable. I think it's um, given Becca more compassion too for other people. So I hear all the time that he's one of the nicest kids in kindergarten. I get um, that too. Very accepting of other children. And I always tell him, I'm like, I want you to go be friends with a kid who needs a friend. Like you go seek out somebody who needs you to be their friend, not that just wants you to. And so I feel like he has a whole group of friends that maybe he wouldn't have if he didn't understand um, diversity and differences in people that um, don't make them unapproachable. You know, he's willing to talk to anybody and I'm super proud of him for that. Last week he was doing a Mother's Day card for me and they were, drawing their mommies and so it was like a stick figure thing that the teacher had already pre-printed and he's like um can you put a wheelchair on here for my mom Aww, and I loved so it and I loved his teacher for it because she went out and found a picture of a woman in a wheelchair and let him color that one so I thought it was really sweet that is cool that's amazing that's great um, and for everyone who's listening, feel free to add any questions in the chat. Um, and we will have a little bit of time in a little bit, but you are welcome to also um, either raise your hand or put your questions in the chat. <clears throat> well, I wanted to ask also um, if you guys had any advice or perspectives that you wanted to share with someone um, that maybe was thinking about um, becoming a mother who's also a woman with a spinal cord injury and maybe has some doubts or questions. Any, any uh, insights? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that it's possible, like, don't doubt yourself just because of the stereotypes out there, like the ones that I've heard and, you know, about it being selfish. It's obviously not. Um, everyone has the right to be a mother and everyone can be an amazing mother. It definitely does take help and like that's just there's no way to really sugarcoat that I mean at least for, for with my function like could I have literally had Kaylee by myself in this like I, I probably couldn't um that's just with my function that's just the truth but um if you're able to have the support like most people need anyways like we were saying before we kind of signed on we, me and uh, Jen were going back and forth and talking and relating to each other that like most parents could use some help, you know? So, but yeah, I personally need a little bit of extra help, but um, with that help, it's, it's amazing. And I mean, I feel like I need almost just as much as help, as much help as you, Rachel, do. I mean, <laughs> I um, could not do this alone, a hundred percent. So my family, my mom and dad are here all the time. I mean, helping between whether it's making bottles or doing a bath while I'm getting back in bed, you know, whatever. Um, it, it takes support for sure. But the other thing I would say is get connected in with a good spinal cord group of other ladies who've done this before and ask questions because there's no point in reinventing this. I was telling Rachel before, I was like, I was looking at your crib on Pinterest, mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out how to, um, you know, get a crib that was going to be accessible for me and stuff like that. And so those are tips and tricks that you can pick up along the way from someone who's done it before. For sure. And also don't be so rigid in your expectations for maybe what you wanted. Like, let's say you had an accident before that accident, you wanted like four kids. It may just not work out that way. I mean, for me, uh, you were talking about wanting a sibling for your son and I really wanted one for Kaylee. I mean, she would have been the best big sister and she asked for a big sister but the reality is we couldn't afford surrogacy again and getting a healthy baby um, is also really difficult. I mean, you, you even knew somebody that was still like a heartbreak and then, you know what I mean? Like, so, um, and it, that can even be expensive um, if you go a certain route. So, um, well, plus my husband's good with one, but whatever. 
<laughs> um, but I mean, I think things would have been different if I were, you know, hundred percent able-bodied, um, because those first, you know, couple months are kind of stressful and it is hard to start over. So, you know, you just might have to like reinvent your idea of like what you may have wanted before your accident, if an accident is what you had. Um, and that's kind of what we had to do, but also I'm like super soulmate connected to Kaylee. So I, I mean, I'm over the moon, happy to be a mom. So. <laughs> me too yeah tell Beckham every day I'm like I love being your mommy and I tell Rum that too and but Beckham's just the age that he can respond he's like I love being your kid yeah and, you know it just means the world yeah and the kid like Kaylee understood well I, she knew what happened to me like I don't even remember the first time I told her I just feel like she's almost always known I don't remember exactly when it came up but um when she was like four she was explaining to like her three-year-old friend like how it happened and she explains how the spinal cord injury, she always makes sure to say it's like a banana because that's what I've told her that, you know, your spinal cord is inside your bones, which is like a banana. And so she always puts that in there and says like her brain can't talk to her feet anymore, or her legs anymore. And she was explaining this to this three-year-old girl and the girl was like, what else? And she's like, that's it. That's the story. <laughs> I let Beckham take ownership of mine for a while. So his version of my story was um, I fell out of a boat and a shark ate me. Um, see, yeah, I always have Kaylee. Kaylee actually, one thing I was worried about, I was super worried that she would be annoyed, like grow up constantly getting questions all the time. I get super annoyed by it. And when she's 12, she probably will. But now she loves it. She, if a kid comes up and wants to know why I'm in a wheelchair, I'll be like, take it away, Kaylee. Like you tell them, in your kid language. Go ahead. Um, and she absolutely loves it. She used to want me to come inside to pick her up from her, like learning. She was in like a learning pod during COVID. Um, of like five kids and she wanted me to come inside because she wanted the kids to like see me so they would ask questions because she just thought that was cool <laughs> Beckham likes my car now because with the Tahoe the door comes up like Lamborghini doors and oh, yeah. um, so he tells everybody it's his robot car and <laughs> he loves that that's great do you guys have any questions for each other I want to leave some space to I know I know you know of, you've know you known of each other, but this is kind of your first time that you met each other. So do you have questions for each other? Um, this is a fun one. Which baby was a harder baby? <laughs> uh, I have to say I've been really blessed with that and that they have both been incredible babies. Yeah, both I was, been the reason I asked is because I was, Kaylee was flawless and I was like, everybody kept telling me this is why people have a second one because their first one is so easy and then the second one is like does not sleep at all <laughs> so I was just curious but I yeah. was afraid of that Beckham was sleeping through the night at four months and Rome's been sleeping through the night since two months wow and um they're both just really good I say um Rome is maybe the sweetest and most honored baby mm -hmm. ever um I can see it's funny because he doesn't have my genetics but I can see my attitude in him yeah um, and I like that about him but it's funny he is very determined already um you should have seen him on his first birthday on Saturday taking out a smash cake with red icing mm -hmm. um it was it was a joy awesome. <laughs> so but yeah they're both really good babies and Beckham will tell you he loves Rome more than he loves anyone and the feeling is mutual because Rome feels the same way about Beckham. The two of them together are so sweet. I adore it. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but especially when Kaylee was younger, um, our kids obviously try to copy us, you know, like, oh, my mom did it this way. So like, I know when Kaylee would be on the iPad, I used my knuckles. So she would start using her knuckle. And I was like, no, you can press the, use your finger. <laughs> so she would start using her knuckles. She would use like teeth to open stuff sometimes. Cause I was like, uh -huh. Roman's so. um, kisses that he blows now are like this instead of like this. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yep. That's for mama. So, so Rachel, I'm curious for you, how was it with your story being so in the spotlight? Um, it felt like, like, I mean, it definitely came with the positives because I have to, like I said, we didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have my job before I got hurt was teaching aerobics and line dancing, not something I could do. You know, and I, I worked at a senior citizen center. And I ran all the programs there and that, I mean, I love that job, but it wasn't something I could really physically do anymore. 
And so we were struggling um, for a little bit there. Then we got a little bit like mediocre where we were good, but somebody can be like a regular old household, but like, again, surrogacy just costs so much money. Um, so I'm happy that it was, because that's why I have Kaylee, but also it does come with a lot of responsibility. Cause like I said, I felt like, you know, my story was the only story that people read. So they were like, oh yeah, exactly. People in wheelchairs can't have babies. Like they have to have a surrogate. And I was just like perpetuating that. And I was like, wait a minute. No, that's just me. That's not all, all of us, you know? Um, and so there was that. And also the nasty comments. Um, and again, those comments, I, they never personally hurt. I wasn't like that person's being mean to me. It was that they were being mean to my people. You know what I mean? Like they were saying that it wasn't possible. Or it wasn't right for people in our situations to have a baby. And that's what made me so angry. Um, so it's not like I was like sad that people felt a certain way about me. It was just the fact that people felt that way at all. Yeah. And I feel like you've had to do a lot of, I mean, you both have had to do a lot of educating like the general public because your stories have been so public and, um, and on social media and in the news that, you know, you both have done a really good job of, of educating people, even though it's not your job to educate people. Well, yeah, but you still want to because you have the platform and you're like, well, what would I want, you know, what, what do people want me to educate people about? I'm like, I'm going to do my best to do that. You can't make everybody happy. Obviously, we all know that. <laughs> and I know that more than anybody else, but I definitely do my best to try at least. But I feel like so often the stories that you hear, whether they're made up movies or whatever, but they have a terrible ending mm -hmm. for people with disabilities. And, you know, it's portraying a sad life and... I don't feel that way. I feel joy every day for the most part of, you know, life is still good and we just figure out a different path. Yeah. And I think um, one thing I try to tell people is like, for example, like if somebody had a magic wand and can cure me tomorrow, I'll take it, you know, I'll, I'll take the cure in a heartbeat. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't live a happy full life just like anybody else. And they might be living with a, um, mental disability of some kind maybe they just have depression it doesn't mean their life is over it's just something they got to deal with and, and, and work around so that's just kind of how i feel feel about this plus i have met some cool people since so that's good that's a plus <laughs> yeah i'm going to say too if you have a spinal cord injury and you need a village reach out to me send me a personal message and i'll get you linked in with our spinal cord group um because it is nationwide and that would be happy to throw you in there too so thank you yeah um i think a big theme today is is needing that village and needing each other and um you know the, the joy that can come from from taking that journey even though it can be scary um and i have a before we wrap up i just want to share a couple of comments in the chat um one that says you are both incredible examples of overcoming and being joyful through adversity what a blessing you are to her, to your children. We are so thankful to be part of Jen's village. And then another comment, I love both of your stories. It gives me a little more hope in motherhood still being a possibility one day. Mm -hmm. so I hope that um, this has been a really good um, session for, for those attending. Um, and I thank you both, Jen and Rachel, for sharing your story with me and with everyone listening. And um, I, I hope that you continue to have joy as your kids grow up. And I'm sure they're going to give you some trouble too once they get to, the, to be their teenagers. Oh, yeah. Um, and That's going to be fun. Um, Emily, I know, has some wrap up um, to do. Let me... Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you guys. We, we love having you guys come in. Um, all right. Um, so thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Um, our upcoming webinars, which are open to the public. Uh, we have pregnancy in June. So I know there's some questions in the chat about pregnancy. That's all next month. Um, and then in July, we're going to talk about preventative health care. Uh, please remember that if you are a woman with an SDI, we are hosting small groups uh, to discuss tonight's topic and to facilitate community. Um, 
If you are a woman with a chronic core injury or know someone who would benefit from these, please visit our website and sign up for our small discussion group or reach out to me. Um, my email is on the screen. Uh, we also appreciate you taking a few minutes to fill out the survey. Uh, it's going to be dropped in the chat one more time. It'll also be emailed to you tomorrow along with the recording of this video. Um, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And a big thank you for Jen and Rachel for being our guests today and sharing your story. Um, Emily, I wanted to add a couple more resources that I'm going to add into the chat. Um, these are just resources that I found um, recently today on um, for women too. One is Tomorrow, it's a Women Living with Paralysis and Dating by the Christopher Ryu Foundation. If anyone's interested, it's in the chat. And also I wanted to get Is Rebecca frozen or is it my internet? I think it's Rebecca. Okay. Um, I think Rebecca wanted to do a shout out for the Raw Beauty Project. Um, they have this incredible art exhibit that's going on right now. Um, so you can check it out on their website, which I believe Rebecca dropped in the chat. Uh, yes, she did. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like she's frozen. So we'll, we'll wrap it up tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Thank Bye. you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.